Continuing our videos on electric fields today and taking it just a little bit further, the first thing we need to look at is the electric field between two parallel plates like this. If we examine these plates closely, we can see that obviously it's plus on the right hand side. So if we looked at the positive charges that are loaded on the right hand side of these plates and the equivalent negative charges on the other side, and we took the radial fields of each of those charges and then got the vector sum of those radial fields, as I described in my previous video, then you would see that the vector sum of all those fields ends up being parallel field lines like this between the plates. And so this is what we call a uniform field. They are equidistant and they go straight from the positive to the negative because, of course, remember, the direction of the arrow tells you what would happen to positive charge being brought into that field. Again, you can demonstrate this, as I described in my last video, using a Petri dish of oil with semolina sprinkled on top of it and connected into an EHT supply, and you would get something like this. Here we can clearly see the parallel lines of the field between the two plates, but of course at the edges, those vector sums don't sum up exactly two parallel lines, and so you get this curvature around the edges. For the most part, we just ignore that and say exactly between the plates, we've got these parallel lines. Now this is a very specific application of electric fields that when I do a busy video on capacitors, I will explain in more detail. But because we have an electrical component based upon parallel plates with a field between them like this, you do need to know what the field between these parallel plates looks like. Let's go back then to looking at our two kinds of fields. We have radial field on the left and we have our parallel plate field on the right. And if we put Again, I'm using the example of positive charges, but this, all of this applies equally to negative charges in negative fields, and the opposite applies to opposite charges in opposite fields. So let's suppose we've got a positive charge that we have brought into this field here. We know because it's in the field that it's going to have a certain amount of potential energy. If you hold it there, you would have to hold it there because otherwise it's going to be repelled. So it has potential energy just by being in the field. Now, if you want to move this charge within the field, then clearly you have to give it some energy or it's going to convert some of that potential energy into kinetic. So you would have to actually give it energy in order to move it closer to the positive charge. And it would convert some of that potential energy into kinetic energy if it moved away from the positive charge thinking about electric field strength as the force per unit charge in the field, obviously where the field is strongest, the force on the particle is going to be strongest. And therefore, you would need more work in order to move against the field where the field is stronger. Remembering that the force on unit charge was Coulomb's law, And if we say, okay, the work that we would have to do against this force is this force times the distance moved inside the field. All right, that should be a squared. And we're going to call the distance moved inside the field R, just because we've been using R for distances all along. And you can see clearly here that these R's are going to cancel. And that means that work done is K Q1 Q2 over R. We can develop this a little further and say the work done per unit charge brought into the field is equal to KQ1 over R. And the work done per unit charge is voltage. Now we are used to thinking of voltage as potential difference but here it is just pure potential. So it's not potential difference. This is giving you an idea of exactly the amount of potential energy the charge has because it's in the field. It's not telling you the difference in its potential energy from one place to another. And this derivation that I've just done here is a very simplified version of the actual derivation, which involves 
some integration. We don't need to be able to do this. In fact, we don't even need to be able to derive this equation, but I think it's helpful for you to understand where it comes from. So this V here is an absolute value of the potential energy of the charge that you have brought into the field. If we zoom in on our radial field again, let's put two positive charges in our field here, and we'll call them charge one and charge two. And let's suppose we want to move charge one and charge two both a distance 10 centimeters closer to the charge at the center that is causing the field. Because charge one is closer in, there's going to be a greater repulsive force on that charge. So to move it 10 centimeters is going to require more energy than it takes to move charge two, the same 10 centimeters. Or we can look at it in terms of the amount of energy that's required. So it may be that for the same amount of energy, we could move charge one 10 centimeters, but charge two would move 20 centimeters because we're pushing against a smaller force. And that is what these dotted lines represent here. Equal amounts of energy required. So let's just say it's one joule as an example to move unit positive charge in between these lines. And you can see those lines get further apart as you move out into the field because of course the repulsive force is less strong out there and therefore you have to do less work to get it in a certain distance or for the same amount of energy you can go a greater distance. And for that reason these lines are called equipotential lines, meaning of course equal potential. Equal amounts of energy are required to move between them. And if you look along the lines, a positive charge anywhere along this outside line would have the same amount of potential. Potential being the potential energy that positive charge has because of its position in the field. Because it's equidistant from the charge causing the field, it has the same potential. And also it doesn't take any work to move from point A to point B in this diagram because the work done is force multiplied by distance moved in the direction of the force. And we are not moving in the direction of the force by moving around these lines. What about with our uniform field? Let's take positive charge and we're going to move it towards the positive plate. Because we have a uniform field, there is the same force on the positive charge throughout this, this distance between the plates. And therefore it's going to take exactly the same amount of energy to move the same distance between these plates. And so our equipotential lines are all parallel and equidistant. When we move charge from one plate to another here, across a difference in potential, we know that the work done is equal to force times distance, same as before. We also know that this is electrical work that's done, and that is equal to Q times V. So we can equate these two. And if we do a little rearranging, this should be familiar to us from the last video. This is electric field strength. And so this is our third equation for electric field strength. Electric field strength is equal to V over D. This can be applied to any field where you have equipotential lines and you know that there's a difference between one equipotential line and the other that will act as your potential difference and your V in this equation, where and D will be the distance between those two lines. But it is particularly useful for parallel plates like this because D is the distance between the two plates when V is the voltage across the plates. So when we're creating circuits and we're putting a voltage across plates like this, and we can measure the distance between them, it gives us a very straightforward way of measuring the electric field strength. A word on equipotential lines, if you have to draw them, you must make sure that you are drawing them perpendicular to the field lines, because they will always be. A couple of years ago, Edexcel rather infamously produced what has become known as the flower question for electric fields. And so I thought it would be a good idea for us to go through this question so you see the kind of thing you can be asked about electric fields in particular. Some flowers are negatively charged and surrounded by an electric field. This helps to attract bees. State what is meant by an electric field. 
Nothing too tricky so far. An electric field is a region in which a charged particle experiences a force. Just something you have to learn. And so it is worth getting it on a flashcard or something like that so that you can remind yourself every so often what it is and so that it embeds itself in your brain. The real kicker came with the next part. The diagram shows lines of equipotential surrounding a flower. Determine the electric field strength at X. Now this threw a lot of people, mostly because we are used to looking at very even radial fields or fields between plates. And people get thrown off when there's an odd context like the flower and then when the fields are not following the lines that they think they should be following. But remembering we have three equations for electric field strength, E is equal to F over Q, E is equal to KQ1 over R squared, and E is equal to V over D. So you're basically looking at the context and determining, can I use the defining equation, E is equal to F over Q? Not here we can't because we don't know what Q is, so that's out. It would be fairly dodgy to assume that this is a pure radial field, and E is equal to KQ1 over R squared applies to that, and in any case, since we don't know Q1 either, we can't use that, which leaves us with E is equal to V over D. Now remember, this V is a potential difference between two equipotential lines, so all we need to be able to do is determine what the potential difference between two lines might be, and then the distance between them. So let's zoom in a little and have a look. This line here, that is the minus 80 volt line. If you follow it up, that's there. And then the one above is the minus 75. So the difference between those two is 5 volts. All we have to do now is determine the distance between them. And at best, this is going to be an estimation. So if we go across from where the seven, minus 75 volt line is here, and perhaps a little higher, that looks to me like 34.4. And where the minus 80 volt line is, looks about 33.4. So essentially, we've got a distance between them of 1. And remember, always look at the axis, that's 1 centimeter. So our equation now is going to be 5 volts divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 2. And that gives us 500. And here's a new unit for electric field strength, volts per meter. Although the context is very unusual and threw a lot of people off, it's not that difficult a question. The next part of the question said, draw the electric field line between points A and point B on the diagram. Remember what I said to you about electric field lines and, and equipotentials, they must be perpendicular. So if we go back up to the diagram and look at points A and point B, all we have to do is draw a line that's going to pass perpendicular to each of the equipotentials between points A and point B. So I would say the first thing you do is you draw your lines perpendicular to the equipotentials. Now, if you think that you might go wrong in drawing those lines, it doesn't do any harm to put in a little perpendicular sign here to show the examiner that even if your drawing is a bit off, you meant to make them perpendicular. And then we just do join up our perpendiculars all the way between A and B. Now remember, electric field lines have arrows on them. So we need to determine in which direction is the arrow going to go. In which direction would positive charge feel a force. And of course, that's going to be towards the most negative part. So that's going to be towards the center of the flower. The last part of this question that we're going to do is this. An equation for electrical potential is given as this. This is familiar to us. We have it as kq over r, remembering that k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. This applies to a radial field. Deduce whether the electric field in the region directly above the flower is radial. You should take values from the diagram. And you're not, they're not expecting you to use a graph. So let's have a think about this. We know that this is essentially saying that v is equal to kq over r. 
And if we cross multiply that, we know that V times R is equal to a constant times Q. Now, these two should be constant when multiplied together because we have a charge producing this field. That charge isn't going anywhere, so it should be a fixed number. So that means that if we take values of V and R directly above the flower, at different distances above the flower, we should see that those are constant if it's a radial field. If they're not constant, it's not a radial field. How many should you take? I would say three, just to be sure. So I'm going to do this up next to the diagram so we can both measure and calculate at the same time. Okay, the first value of VR I'm going to take at where V is equal to minus 95 volts. And I want to see what the R from the center of the flower is. So that's the center of the flower there at about 29.8. How far away from that is our minus 95 line? And that looks to me like 31.8. So R, I'm going to say, is 2 centimeters, making VR minus 190 volt centimeters. Okay, that's our first one. Second one, I'm just going to go up to the 90 line, which is there. And again, measuring from the center of the flower, that looks to me to be about well, 0.3 centimeters above. So our V is now minus 90. And our R is 2.3 centimeters, giving a VR of minus 207 volt centimeters. So, so far it's not looking good for being a radial field. Let's keep going. Just one more. So, minus 85. That looks to be at about 32.5. So I'm going to call R at 2.7 centimeters making VR minus 229.5 volt centimeters. And I think that confirms it. And of course, you would have to write this at the bottom of the question. Since the value for VR is not constant, it is not a radial field above the flower.